Dr. Jamie Reynolds, thanks so much for being on the Grow Ortho podcast today. Thanks for having me. Maybe for those listening and watching, just give a, a brief overview of your background and, and where you are and, and a little bit about your practice and uh, your company. My name's Jamie Reynolds. Um, I've been practicing um, in July will be 22 years, I think. Um, I started working in 2002 with a, uh, for a guy named Larry Splane for Splane Orthodontics and then um, worked in associate for three or four years and then um, it became Splane and Reynolds Orthodontics. We were one location in Novi, Michigan. We added a second one maybe six years, seven years in, um, in the great recession when yeah. we didn't know whether it would be a dumb idea to add a new spot or not to try and grow. Um, it seemed dumb at the time. It worked out. Um, Detroit didn't uh, fall into a crater as it seemed like it might back then when the sky was falling. Uh, we were two locations for a while. Um, we went to open a third in between and we wound up accidentally kind of adding a fourth location at the same time. So we went from two locations to four in about a couple of weeks. Um, took us 20 some years for Larry to add a second location. We kept that one, two locations for about eight or nine years and then added a couple in a couple of weeks, um, which taught us a lot about our ability to scale. <laughs> we thought we were a lot more ready to scale than uh, not. And then uh, he retired during COVID. Uh, the name changed to Reynolds Orthodontics. We now have a handful of other doctors, including Jen Bonamisi, who's um, in the process of becoming um, the next partner in the practice since I joined. Um, and I've had a number of other doctors along the way. And um, so we're, uh, you know, I'm in the clinic three, two, three, four days a week, depending on the week, including this morning. And, um, uh, you know, we've got a couple of other business things that we're working on as well. Um, but that's the that's the clinical side of things. It seems that you became very focused uh, on the business side and optimizing the practice to uh, run like a, a well-oiled machine, a, a you know, a well-functioning business. Uh, was Was it always like that or were there some epiphanies along the way that made you start to think and learn more about the business? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm sure anyone that's ever tried to operate a business, you know, it, it was never always that way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah you <laughs> so, kind of crash uh, your way through it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so Larry Splane ran a very nice ortho practice, and I was very fortunate that he was interested in me joining. At the time, it was a great opportunity. You know, he ran one of the biggest and most well-oiled operations in the Midwest, which at the time was a little over $2 million in production, you know, 500-ish starts. I don't think we were really tracking anything back then. Mm. Most things were kind of run. I mean, it was a great reputation, one location, you know, well-run, team very well-trained, but in retrospect, um, you know, very amateur in the business operations of it. And and everything was run by feel. Um, mm. and, you, know, we would, you know, and we would say, okay, well, we didn't really have starts goals. We didn't really have any goals. It was just show up to work. We were the good reputation in the office. When I joined, it was just sort of a, you know, presumption that we were going to grow. Um, I paid at the time a very high premium so back then, practices were trading at, you know, 0.5 to 0.8 times collections. Um, I paid 1.1 times back then, which was a lot, um, you know, because it was a premium practice. And I think the presumption was if we wanted to grow, we would just grow. And then, um, you know, I worked for a year. Uh, husband and wife team opened up in my Novi town the same time as I joined Larry. So it was the first time he had a competition. They were marketing pretty aggressively against his practice and his reputation. Um, we kind of swam upstream in that for a little bit. And then for those that are old enough to remember, like the automotive thing in Detroit wasn't that great back then. <laughs> and before the great recession hit, 
um, it hit Detroit. The automotive companies went through a bunch of layoffs and cuts, and so we had hard times um, for a while here um, to the point where we were trying anything to attract folks in, and um, it was really kind of trial by fire um, where some of the business things happened. Then when we opened our second location, it was an hour across town, um, and you know, if you open a location and all of your team members go over there with you, then a lot of that feel just kind of comes with you. But if you, Mm -hmm. if it's further away and you have to hire new people to go over there and run it, which we did. Um, And at the time, Larry wasn't in favor of doing a a new location. I was young and hungry. We hadn't grown like we thought we were. I was paying him a lot for practice that wasn't really worth it at the time. So I wanted to I had more hustle and risk <laughs> tolerance than he did. Um, and so our sort of main team didn't go with me. So then what I learned over time was that there were a lot of things that I didn't understand how they were happening in the business. They just were. Um, and so I needed to get more people to help me and a lot more documented and all of that. Uh, we got that kind of sorted out and then was working well for a while, but we were too far apart. And then when we added the third and fourth locations, I really, it was a crash course and our stuff isn't together. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And it took us a while to fix it, you know? Um, So, uh, you know, and then we can talk about however much detail that we want, but it it certainly wasn't ordained. Um, I I started working for a good single location, but that's very different than a multi-location practice in different cities with different teams. Um, And I learned all of it the hard way or from copying off of people who had figured it out ahead of me. So there was some combination of learning ready, fire, aim as the book goes and, um, and trying to find other people as fast as I could that had already done this and figure out how to cut the curve, right? What was your drive to uh, build and scale beyond just the average practice? Um, What was kind of your why and drive behind that? Was it because at the time you thought you had to because of maybe, you know, debt and, you know, building a thriving practice or else, you know, you may have to go work as an associate? What was kind of your thought process and drive behind we've got to make this work, even though there may be some roadblocks, speed bumps, obviously, I mean, a recession. Yeah. Talk, talk us through that. You know, at the beginning, it was probably, we, we had a 1.25 to 1.5 doctor practice and we had two doctors there. Um, and I was like every other young associate thinking that I was doing all the work and the old guy wasn't doing any of the work. Right. And so, um, which, I, you know, was probably partially true and partially, you know, the arrogance that all the young pups out there have (laughs) and the value that they bring. You know, I just wanted us to be working at maximum potential. And I knew that, you know, I had a friend across town who sent me some of his patients. Um, He was a TMJ doc and we were doing things a certain way that he liked. And he's like, hey, this retiring guy over here is... um, is retiring. So maybe you guys, I'll send you all my patients. If you come over here, do you have enough time? And I was like, sure, I've got an extra day or two a week. I don't mind driving over there. I grew up on that side of town and just kind of fell into place. We spent very little money on the practice. There was 55 grand in accounts receivable. And I think we paid 50 grand for the practice. Mm. We had instruments and old x-ray machine. Uh, I'm going to drop a pain in the building for 30 years, you know, um, So it it wasn't nice by any means, but it gave us a little bit of a foothold. Um, And then when the economy crashed, we got a great deal to move into a new space that we wouldn't have been able to afford in any other time. And that kind of helped us, um, you know, start to scale because we put together a nice little thing while everyone else was kind of hibernating. Um, So then when the recession started to turn, it started to do better. But from there... um, was less about anything other than I felt like there was opportunity. So um, it felt like, you know, we, we needed the one in between the two offices. When I, when we opened the second one, I told myself that that was way harder than I thought it was going to be. We're never opening another office ever again. Right. And then, you know, after a while I was like, well, 
you know, we really could use one in between. And I had kind of moved in between. My kids were growing up there. So then my wife was like, it'd be nice to have something closer to the kids. And so we started looking there. And then a friend of mine had sold her practice to a young resident and moved to New Jersey already. And the resident backed out at the last minute. So then she kind of called me at the 11th hour and said, hey, you want another practice in Troy? And I said, no. <laughs> but then I wound up, we wound up. So it was kind of, it wasn't me like sitting down with some business plan and like being super strategic about it, which is not the advice that I would give someone younger than me what to do. I would say be much yeah. more strategic. And I, I was fortunate that the landscape was, you know, less sophisticated and capable yeah. then than it is now, you know? So I th- you have to have a much higher game to be out there competing than you did back then because you can't just have a few bucks and, and a sign and then things are going to work out. Like no one will ever see you. You've got to find yourself fun. You got to be a much better business person, marketer, salesperson, operations person than I ever had to be. You know, yeah. so most of it was dumb luck and failure. Yeah, it's interesting because we even see that in our own business. Um, for the first four or five years, we didn't strategize at all, and uh, we got lucky. Uh, you know, and and we worked hard. But then, as we started to strategize, we grew a lot faster than previous years. I'm interested um, in the OSO that that you're involved with. Have you, as well as some of the other um, ownership and leadership in that OSO, have you guys been able to uh, systemize things and then see practices like you're, you're saying, you know, the advice that you give younger practices? Are you guys able to collapse time? And now that you have a system and framework, you see it work much faster than maybe just figuring it out? Yeah, so, um, you know, so we're, uh, our office and Jeff Kozlowski's office are too, uh, with David Starr, with the founding offices of Orthodontic Partners. Um, y- you know, that wasn't the intention of adding multiple practices, but, um, you know, back when the economy stunk, we were trying to figure out a, a lot of what we've learned has come from us realizing, hey, we're not good at this. So mm-hmm. let's figure out how to do it. Um, we weren't good at being affordable for our patients. We weren't good at sales. We weren't good at tracking stuff. You know, Larry was not a numbers guy, so we didn't have conversion metrics. We didn't want, you know, do any of that. And long story short, um, that led us to starting OrthoFi with Dave Turner and Jeff Kozlowski back yeah. in, you know, 11 years ago. Um, and then the exposure to a lot of different things, including property investments and board positions and understanding the investment landscape and strategy and blah, 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 um, led us to kind of start orthodontic partners. Um, mm-hmm. Rather than sit on the sideline and watch things unfold, we thought we might be capable of building a better mousetrap, for lack of a better explanation so um so that's what kind of took us down that path um i would say you know there's two very broad brush strokes you know components in the practice right there's like your clinical operations and then there's your business operations right um so you know i think a lot of the group things have sort of tried to amalgamate the two um and run them Similarly, um, in my experience, especially with the orthodontist, it doesn't it doesn't work. Um, mm. and so, you know, teaching a doctor how to answer the phones differently is one thing. Um, teaching a doctor how to do things more efficiently or to use a different system that you may or may not like, um, or kind of making them feel a little bit more commoditized by taking some of their jurisdiction from their clinical stuff. It's just different. Yeah. So um, we approach the two things differently. So we've got a lot of folks that are really um, amazing, groundbreaking cl- uh, clinicians in our group. And the way that, uh, you know, all of us, some of them are just, you know, genetically superior, <laughs> like Stuart and Moz and Dave and Kaz and those guys. And so God bless them. The rest of us um, 
have sort of patterned ourselves after those folks and um, tried to be continually better. So I talk about being a, a pull model rather than a push, right? Push would be like, here, do this, take this, eat this, right? Um, pull would be like, hey, I want to do that. How do I do that? Right. So a lot of us have seen the, you know, Dwight Damons of the world give amazing lectures and show how they can do better clinically. And we're like, I want to learn how to do that. Tell me more. So we have a model where we have, um, you know, uh, meetings and um, both virtually and in person where a lot of the great folks will talk about what they do and then people can learn more and do more. Mm. We implement some efficiency things just to kind of level set. And we have a very transparent benchmarking across all the practices so everybody can see the whole foundation principle was even the best practices are really good at some things and not so great at the other. And so if we could get a bunch of the best practices, then you could find out what everybody's great at and then like lift the level for everybody. Yeah. Uh, and so on the business side of things, though, we do have um, some operational things that we do. We have a phone system that we put in. We have a practice management system and OrthoFi and some tracking things that we look at so that, you know, a lot of the business things can be handled more objectively, um, whereas the clinical stuff, I mean, trying to get two orthodontists to agree on anything clinically is super subjective as much as we might yell at each other otherwise. So, um, you know, we try to manage the objective, the truly objective things the way that we can. So we do have some business management and HR systems that we layer in that we think, you know, and we're still learning, I think, as everybody always is, but we think our you know, best in class. Yeah. <laughs> and we see, you know, I, I've listened to a lot of the content you guys put out. I think it's very sharp. Um, but, Thank you. you know, most of the things that I hear the successful folks talk about, you know, Marcus Aurelius was talking about way back when, right? So it's a lot of it isn't hugely groundbreaking. It's right. more about being consistent, and developing objective, repeatable, scalable systems and, and leadership to get people to do it, um, rather so much than reinventing the wheel. I mean, there's digital things and whatnot that are, you know, different in a way, but um, a lot of the stuff you need to do is just the fundamentals, right? Um, right. And even the best practices struggle to answer the phone. Um, they struggle with getting their patients to show up for their appointments, you know, booking the amount of people with appointments that should have the appointments, et cetera, et cetera, converting the patients that come in. So um, we focus a lot on that, the fundamental stuff, control what you can control. You know, if the economy goes down and your practice dips, just make sure it only dips the amount that the economy truly dictates and not because you're not doing the things that you need to be doing. Right. So. Right. Yeah, and talking about uh, Marcus Aurelius, and you talk a lot about mindset also in your book. Um, what are maybe some of the limiting beliefs or um, fixed mindsets that maybe you see that actually hold orthodontists back? I think orthodontists are the same as most. The only difference is, is that there's a pretty high barrier to entry, right? So like everyone that is an orthodontist is very, very smart and has been very successful um, in their career. Um, you know, I was listening to one of your guys' podcasts on the way in this morning and I was thinking, you know, the one thing that all orthodontists have in common is that they all know it all the day they graduate residency, Right. <laughs> That we all have that in common. So we all think we have it all figured out. And when we get into residency, out of residency, you know, and I was as guilty or more than anyone of thinking I had it all figured out, right? What I think this separates the people who become truly successful and not is if they and how quickly they realize that they actually know nothing, right? And they have tons to learn, right? So Adam Woody, who's the CEO of Advantage Media Forbes Books, he says, you're either a know-it-all or a learn-it-all. And yeah. the people that I see that are successful um, are all learn-it-alls, right? And so um, they're constantly trying to get better um, and surround themselves with people that are better and learn from them. And so uh, that's really the biggest thing that I see. We all think we know it all when we're done with residency, but a lot of us continue to think that way. 
Um, I don't know why, for whatever reason, you know, I grew up in a small town and, and the fact that I can sit in some of the rooms that I can today with some of the minds and skill sets that I do still puts me in awe. And I, I just am constantly wanting to learn from, uh, people, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. that's, I think the one common denominator to all the people that I succeeded to well is always getting better when having that sort of intellectual humility, um, and a lot of the ones that I think think they know it all just kind of str struggle. I, you know, I'm yeah. not sure if that's what you see with the clients. Yeah, I mean, I've even, like you said, I've been guilty of it myself. I think accomplishment does that to people. You know, you build up that self-esteem and I'm accomplished and maybe you start to think you do know it all based off the little success when, when you actually start looking at uh, the potential you know, um, and I think it's getting out of your own way and zooming out and, and like you said, actually looking at the opportunity and knowing that uh, we can be more and do more and we've never really arrived. But I see a lot of orthodontist and, and it's interesting because the average practice, I, I hear different numbers, you know, I hear anything from 1.2 to 2 million or, or whatever, and it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and the the opportunity, I think, and, and you would know better than I with growth is Chris Benson talks about this too. Uh, you can easily scale past that, you know, with, with the opportunity, the market, the data shows um, how uh, fast the market can grow, you know, mm -hmm. with adults being uh, one of the largest demographics now to grow the space. Obviously, that may not be happening today based on the economy, but we know that it's going to and the opportunities there. Um, I see so much control and I see this in other businesses too of I'm the leader, or I'm the business guy or I'm the orthodontist and so I know how to do it better. You know, and, and that to me and based on what I observe is the biggest limiter. We'll see uh, orthodontists um, who will have a, a TC in training, sometimes for two years. And they're still uh, really dictating and running the consultation when most orthodontists are probably not that great at sales. Some of them are, for sure. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it's not the best use of their time to run and manage every aspect of the practice from payroll, time off requests, one-on-one -on -one meetings, you know, if those even exist in the practice, running the consultation. Um, it's just not scalable. And so I think objectively looking at it and, and a lot of times less is more, you know, obviously you want to disclose what's going to happen to patients, but I don't want to hear as a patient and I, I, you know, went through Invisalign recently as a retreat. I don't want to hear every, all the details yeah. I just here's my problem. Here's what I want fixed. I want to feel good. I want good customer service. And in your book, you talk about what uh, people place weight on, what the consumer places weight on. And I think that's really important for uh, orthodontists to understand. Yes, they want quality care, but if they don't have good service and convenience, and if it's not affordable, they're probably going to go somewhere else. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think... Um you know, consumerism is here, right? And like, yeah. um, whether we want it to be or not. And so we can put our hand, head in the sand and pretend that it's it's not, um, that, but that's to our own detriment, right? Because the patients don't know enough to discern whether or not, you know, um, who to choose and whatnot, you know? Mm. Um, and so I think that's not an excuse to like not be a great clinician. Right. So you still want to put the same focus on giving great clinical results and whatnot. And regardless of whether you want a 1 million or a $10 million practice, like there's not a one size fits all. And even if you could run a $10 million practice, um, you might not want to, you know, right. um, yeah. it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So like, it's not for everyone. Um, and so I, I don't think, you know, again, thinking about starts is like every start is somehow better. It's, it's just different. Um, but 
if you're not understanding the orthodontic patient as a customer um, and thinking about them as a patient and the customer patient, get you the same treatment as always, never recommend any treatment you wouldn't do for your own kids, high integrity, the whole bit. But like, also, what else do they want? You know, and you guys talk about time is, is their big thing that they want, solving problems for stuff, right? And then, um, you know, convenience, you know, and, and I think if you look at any business that services customers, um, a, a, a lot of the same stuff, you know, you just talk about Chick-fil-A and, you know, yeah. all, all the things, they, it's convenience and, and time, um, fun, uh, affordability, you know, a lot of the, you know, professionalism or uh, authority that you can talk about establishing and whatnot. It's the same recipe in a different form or fashion for a lot of businesses. So, just understanding that and realizing that if you want to continue to com compete from a, a business perspective, which if you're a great clinician is great for your customers, right? Because they get better treatment. Um, and we're just not wired to train that way. So it's, it's different. Um, but uh, you have to learn to keep up. And it's, it's a lot more complicated than it used to be. Now, there's a lot of other things, tools and things like Orthofy and whatnot that just weren't available that kind of work out of the box there's folks like you all that have great advice for this stuff that there was not really many of back in the day or they're giving you different advice you know there's one the only financial consultant out there was giving the exact opposite advice way back then you know put everybody into a box and charge as much as you can and don't treat x y and z patients and you know it's just not the way that it it really is anymore and there's a lot of stuff that's proven that this the models that you know, folks like you are talking about work, right? Right, right. You mentioned data a lot and obviously looking at OrthoFi and, and um, practice management and other data inside the practice. What are the, some of the key things that you look at uh, in terms of data to, to use and make better decisions? I think if you make things really simple, right, if you boil it down to one number, it's new patient starts, right? So... We have to make profit in order for the lights to stay on, right? Unless we have some benefactor that's going to help us run <laughs> things. But I mean, you know, you got to pay money. Your kids got to eat, right? And your employees' kids got to eat. So, you know, what drive starts? Now, there's the clinical component where you give them great customer service and a great finished result and the dentists like it, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, that feeds into it. And then there's the marketing and things that you do into it. But really, at least for now, the only avenue for patients to really come into the practice is by the phones, right? The web tools are kind of clunky. And even if you want to do an online schedule or exclusively, it's it's best to communicate with them by the phones, you know? So you've got to have really good eyes on your phones. So are you answering the phones? What's your handle rate, right? And most people don't know that, Um we didn't, and when we first started measuring, it was around 50 60%. Um, and we thought we were great, and that's one of the first thing we turn on in ortho partners is phones, and everybody's in the 50 60% range, even though they think that they're not. Wow. And then you got to know it by by head, right? So, like, who, how, how many calls is each person answering? Because invariably, there's kind of like one that's doing a lot and one that's not doing a lot. And then what's your show rate? So when you schedule an appointment, do they come, right? So are you doing things like confirmation calls and communicating with them ahead of time to help them, remind them? Are you doing all these things to get them to come? And then if you recommend treatment, what's your conversion percentage? You know, um, and if you just look at that stuff, like that's enough. Um, right, yeah. You know, and I would say that before you do anything else, those numbers have got to be in order because anything more sophisticated, more expensive, everyone wants to do Facebook and Instagram and, you know, spend thousands of dollars on Google ads and whatnot. And that's all throwing money down the toilet. If you don't answer your phones, you don't get them to come in when they schedule. And when you recommend treatment, they don't convert, you know? And all of your other investments are so much more powerful if you get those three things. We both talk about the the leaky bucket a lot. I <laughs> yeah. read that in your book, and 
I mean, it's a it's a big part of what we explain to people, uh, and I think a, a lot of real really anyone in business because you see most small businesses close over a decade, and I think that's why they they never plug the leaks in the yeah. business and. They don't even really know they exist because they're they're so focused on other things. What's the biggest problem of the day? Or we've got to put this fire out. And so, you know, zooming out and just looking holistically at the customer journey, or in this case, the patient patient journey, and making sure that uh, the fundamentals are being done. But I'm so glad you said that around the phones. You know, with AI coming out, and obviously the internet's been here a long time people think that there's a magic switch to bypass the phones. Uh, yeah. We can get get this AI bot or this scheduler, and I don't think the human-to-human -human aspect is going anywhere for a long time. When you can get the person on the other end on the phone and get that commitment, show them you're a human, show them that you've got great tone, you, you care about them, you want to provide a great experience – I think that does a lot, and and oftentimes we skip over the weight that that could be placed on that call in terms of really winning over the patient. I totally agree. Um, orthodontics is, has, and will be for a long time a relationship business. Yeah, uh, and so you know, it's that's hard um, and exhausting. You know, so like being the captain of the pizza party all the time, weeks, months, years on end is exhausting. You know, you've got to be chipper when everybody else isn't, because if you're grumpy, then it sinks the ship. You've got to be nice to people when they don't deserve it. You've got to be nice to people when they do deserve it and you don't feel like it. You, know, you got to get out and talk to your dentists in the community and continue that relationship with them. You know, de referral dentistry, uh, referral marketing in dentistry is not dead uh, by any stretch. There's still, it's not as you know, big as it used to be, but the market's growing. So like there are a lot more people are getting ortho. So if the dentist chips off some of them, like who cares, frankly, encourage them, get them to be doing more ortho. 90% of them will just send you more and a handful of them will do most of them themselves. But most of them who do it themselves come back to like the hard cases when the liners are hard, even for us right. want to deal with them. They make a lot more money doing crown and bridge. So like, Building the relationships is, is exhausting, but it's it's the key. And if you stop doing that, then, you know, there, there's no bot. I mean, OrthoFi has a, um, there's an interesting stat, and I'll try to remember it without my slideshow in front of me. But um, when you sign up as a new patient, it, it sends out automated reminders. And if you haven't filled out your forms, you get a reminder until you fill them out, right? And... Um, about 70% of people on average at the low end fill out their forms, which is pretty good, right? You send out the reminders and you don't have to call them and bug them and you get 70%. And of those, about 5 or 10%, let's say, wind up same day starting if you recommend treatment. Now, at the top end of that group is about 80 to 83% form fill, right? So the delta is like low 70s to low 80s. So not very big delta as far as form fill. Um, but same day starts for the top end that's getting that extra form fill is around 80, 85%, right? Which is like a practice mind altering mind, like practice evolving, changing difference in magnitude of same day starts. <clears throat> and the difference is really in order to get an incremental increase in form fills, you have to call them and do a confirmation call and set the expectations and, and remind them, get a person that says, hey, I'm a person telling you another person that you need to fill this form out. But at the same time, you can start building that relationship and set that expectations and all the things you, you know, you get, I heard you guys talk about in your sales ones. You know, it's it's not the the close that matters, it's the open, right? Right. Totally agree. So all that stuff that happens in like the close is kind of irrelevant, you know, which close users of that that maybe makes a handful of percent difference, but it's really all the stuff you did before. And so getting that relationship started before they come in and setting the expectations that they could start that day makes a 10x, you know, difference in same day start percentage. 
And that's only by human touch. And if you, it's kind of the number behind the number. So if you say, well, 10% increase in form fill, who cares? Like a 10x increase in same day star percentage is like literally would change your practice and personal financial life, right? Massive. So that's relationships. That's the effort. That's doing the things other people aren't doing. It's continuing to have that touch. So, you know, you, you could talk scale and you can do this and that. The, the other thing um, I think worth and honest or bad at is that we're all very successful. We all are narcissistic and have egos and whatnot. We wouldn't be doctors if we weren't, right? We wouldn't have spent that much time on ourselves, investing in ourselves. Um, mm-hmm. But we tend to think like if somebody does something better than us, um, especially from a business and operational standpoint, that it must come at the sacrifice of something else, right? So if we're more efficient, we see more patients, we must be cutting corners elsewhere. And I'll tell you, if you've ever stepped foot in Jeff Kozlowski's office, that place runs like a like Toyota built it, right? Like it's lean, all pieces are moving at all times, Like, but they're just better operationally than everybody else. They focus on it clinically, so every thing that they do in the clinic also is looked at with a lens of operational efficiency, which actually is better for the patient because you get the same, not sacrificing the outcome, but getting there with less visits, right? Patients love that. It opens the practice up to see more patients or take more time off or work at a less cadence, but it's all pieces of the machine are moving all at the same time where most offices, most of them are sitting there. And so the assumption that I see 100 patients and you see 80 is such a reductive and blunt like metric to look at, you know? Uh, everyone always assumes, well, if you see more patients than me or your practice is bigger than me, then you must be sacrificing quality. And that's it's complete BS. Maybe, maybe that the way you got there is cutting corners, but that's not the only way. And that's not the way that you should take. You should should think about your business like it's a business. And, you know, there's sales, operations, and finance are the components of every business. And you should be working on those things, right? And um, and the operations component means Build better systems, train your team, empower them, you know, get them out of their fixed mindset and continue to coach them and make them better so that you have more sets of capable eyes looking at the same thing so that your quality goes up. Because unless you're seeing one or two or three patients a day, everybody's, and even then you're going to miss stuff. If you have other people helping you not miss stuff because they're smart and capable and, and knowledgeable, then it's better for everybody. It's just hard. It's hard to do that. And then people leave. They get poached by other places. They want to move to Florida because it's warmer and their husband got a job or whatever. Like it's it's hard to do it over and over and over again. But that's I, I don't know that I don't know another way. There's tools that can make things easier and scale and whatnot, but the fundamentals as you talk about are the same. For sure. I want to end uh with just getting your take on how bright is the future for orthodontics? I don't know what the latest stats are. Invisalign showed one a year ago where 3% of the market that needed treatment was treated. I don't know how much more. We're more now. Now, how much more? Let's say that it's, you know, 3x since then, you know, so maybe we're at 10% of the available market is getting treatment. I mean, unlimited. Hmm. It's different. Um, I think owning and operating your own business, if that's the metric you're using at, is harder because they're more sophisticated and more expensive. You know, uh, when we bought our practice in Rochester, we had an old film x ray machine and took alginates and we had charts like paper charts. Um, so it wasn't very expensive to like get up and going. Um, you could still do it that way, I think. I don't think a lot of the young people choose to do it that way. They want to have Macs everywhere and cone beams and <laughs> for a scanner at every chair, you know, and do dumb things because young people are dumb. But, like, yeah. it's just more expensive. I think you probably have to have a scanner to compete today at, at minimum. You could probably have charts, um, you know, uh, but you don't need a CBCT. We have... All four of our offices have CBCTs in them. I I wouldn't practice without them, but we're a 40-year-old operation, you know, so we didn't have them all on day one everywhere, you know? Exactly. So, like, 
it's it's harder to compete, and I think you have to be smarter. The amount of dumb things that I've done over the years probably would put me out of business if I did those dumb things again today. Um, but you also didn't have the same example. So like for every DSO or OSO that's out there that you could throw shade at for being bad, they also are are showing you the recipe for attracting and treating customers. Smile Direct Club for all its failures, you know, if you want to look, they did a lot of things right. They treat a lot of people for a really shitty product. So, mm-hmm. like, um, how do they treat so many people? You know, there's a there's a recipe there that we should be watching and emulating, you know? 100%. And so, I think we should be looking around and instead of throwing shade at everybody that's doing something different or more or whatever than what we're doing, we should be looking at, like, what are they doing that I'm not and how can I modify what I'm doing to fit within my paradigm of how I want to treat patients, but to do it better than what I'm doing now, both clinically and operationally and from a marketing and sales position, you know? So you just have to be a bit smarter at it, but, you know, and again, you know, you can, if you go work at a DSO or an OSO, like, are you mailing it in? You know, are you sitting there every day and like, just treating the patients and complaining how you get to see patients, how many patients you have to see, right? Are you like looking at the systems and seeing how they do things and learning so that you can stand on your own two feet one day? Are you, what happens if when you don't work there anymore? You know, I mean, if I could give a, a young doc one question to ask himself it would be what happens when you don't work here anymore? And if the answer is things stay the same or things get better, then that's not a good answer for you. You've made yourself a, a commodity. You're a pharmacist now. So we can just put another piece in there and then, you know, that's not what you want. Like, if you have the opportunity to go out and meet the doctors in your community, go do it. If you can talk to a parent, do that. Build relationships. Get to know their kids. Get to know their dog's names. Like, do all of those things so that you're valuable more so than just somebody who has a license. Yeah. And a lot of the young folks don't really look at it that way. They look at it as sort of, well, I've got to make my loan payments and... You know, if you kind of treat it the opportunity that way, then that's the way the opportunity is going to give back to you, which is not much, right? Yeah, stop worrying about trying to be a success and just worry more about being valuable. And that's just growth. Growing that's every what single makes you successful, right? If you don't bring value to anything, then you know you're not going to ultimately have continued success. And the day that I stop running fast is the day that somebody else catches me, you know, mm. and that day gets closer and closer every single day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting old and tired, you know, yeah. but the, um, it, it's nobody's entitled to anything, you know, no orthodontist is entitled to anything. No person is entitled to anything. Like the world is a tough place in all aspects. Orthodontics is no different. And if you want that patient to come to you or trust your their children with you, then you have to offer them value and you have to deliver on your value, you know? So you can't sell ice to Eskimos as it goes for too long before people figure it out, you know? So like Smile Direct Club, they figured it out. They went bankrupt, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's a lot of offices that people, I think, are busy that people blame this, that, and the other that actually do really good work. And the customers in the community are happy and they're involved and engaged in all the things. And that's why they have thriving businesses, you know? Yeah, it's about nailing those four components. And and I think Smile Direct Club really just got the first two, which is marketing and sales. You know, they didn't have the operations and they, they certainly didn't deliver quality. For viewers or listeners who maybe want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do that? My email is jamesbreynolds18 at gmail.com. So um, they can shoot me an email. Um, I'm not terribly hard to find. The worst case, you could Google my practice and give the office a call and ask how to get in touch with me. Happy to help. Uh, So many people have helped me learn and become better and help me fix dumb things that I've done. You know, we, Oliver Gellis gets a ton of credit for that book that you mentioned, but it, um, that's there to help folks cut the curve from the learning curve from what we um, took us a long time with a, a bunch of smart people to figure out that stuff. 
um, which other businesses, by the way, had figured out decades ago. <laughs> so if you show most people from outside ortho the contents of that book, they're like, yeah, what's so important about this? this we, we knew this already, you know? Right. So sure. uh, anything um, I can be helpful with, please, you know, people are welcome to reach out. Perfect. Well, thanks so much. And if this resonates with you, this is the book, uh, Level the Curve. I believe I got it on Amazon, I think. And so yeah. uh, you could go pick it up there. Dr. Jamie Reynolds, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me.